So good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's live discussion. My name is Kate Nash, and I'm the founder and chief executive of Purple Space, the world's only network of disabled employee networks and resource groups. And of course, we have 600 change agents across the employers community, reaching our estimate 440,000 disabled people, building disability confidence from the inside out. And of course, not all are network leaders we have allies and champions amongst our community. So today we welcome the extraordinary game changer, John Amici. Everyone knows John, and if you don't, well, I'm sure you're, you're rocking up to hear more. So John, thank you so much for coming along today. Um, just a couple of introductions, and then I'm, I'm gonna hand over to you. So, you know, John, as, as you know, we, we take a different leadership theme each month and look at it in different ways. And this month we're, we've been focusing on career progression. And of course, you know, although we are living through the most extraordinary of times, as all of us as global citizens are navigating our way through this pandemic, we thought it was important to keep the temperature high when supporting members to retain ambition, you know, a sense of movement in our lives. Um, so, you know, why don't you introduce yourself and what, what was on your mind when you said yes to this in relation to the theme? I believe you were twisting my arm behind my back and that's what happened. <laughs> I think, so I think it, it is extraordinary times and I just, I broadly think the ambition of in most organizations is fair to middling when it comes to, to, diversity i think at this time i have people have probably if they've seen me anywhere they see me talking about race and race uh, and racism on television or radio or something else and i think it's really important for people to recognize that we are not limited beings that we can be allies on multiple fronts at the same time we, we are not restricted to empathy towards black people this week and and those with the disability next and and, and women the next it, that's not who we are as people it, at least it doesn't have to be who we are and so for me it's just really important to to reassert the fact that this kind of advocacy is important and to 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 add a voice to important issues and, and i do know as well and, and i know we're going to go on to talk about this i've talked to uh, colleagues and friends of mine, um, uh, some of whom are wheelchair users, and they've found themselves kind of not in the conversation at the moment. Yeah. Whatever priority there might have been has been usurped um, because gender and then uh, LGBT and then in, in the last six weeks only probably race as, as if disability doesn't cross over all of these dimensions, creating multiple stresses. So anyway, I'm just here as a, a, a an advocate who's willing to learn at this point. Lovely. Yeah, I've spoke. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, really thrilled that you join us. You know, I call you a fellow traveller. You know, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm keeping up with you. I don't know whether it's my wobbly legs or your longer legs. However, you know, fellow travellers in this you know, topic, this need to shine a spotlight on, on justice. Mm -hmm. um, so John, I'm going to jump into a little conversation starter here. Um, and I meant to say, of course, you're Vice President of Activity Alliance, our latest members. That is right. Um, a wonderful brilliant. organization. Brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, so John, I, I want to kick off with, um, with an expression, you know, this wonderful expression the soft bigotry of low expectation, you know, really powerful one. And it's been used skillfully to, you know, call out and highlight, I suppose, the, the indifference towards academic performance when it comes to uh, African American children. You know, there's different, there's different stories as to when it was first used, etc. But that expression, the soft bigotry of low expectation, we use it all of the time at Purple Space. And we use it to refer often to the career chances or sometimes the lack of career chances of disabled people. And I suppose as we reflect on this last period, the pandemic, uh, the tough time that a lot of disabled people have in terms of shielding or self-isolating, you know, we're not fans of the language of vulnerability. You know, a lot of our members will prefer to use susceptibility 
um, but nonetheless, you know, really tough time. And of course, you know, the tragic death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, all people movements, you know, what, what do people need to do to rise, to be their best self at work, John? This is a tough one for me. And we were talking about this just before we, we started. And, and this is a tough one for me because I do, I like the personal accountability element, right? I like the idea of ensuring that each person is not only willing to, but brings consistently their, their fire every day, that they show up and that they are fully prepared. They, they have done all the pre-work. They have, you know, brought, brought themselves to work in a way that they can absolutely deliver. And, but that sits alongside the idea that I feel like many people have to armor themselves to come to work. That, it, that it's not really a question of can you bring your whole self to work? Very clearly you can't. Very clearly you're supposed to bring the, the face of you that causes other people the least personal discomfort. That's actually what we're doing. So we're getting people who are twisting themselves, contorting themselves, and then being expected to deliver and also being criticized if they're not delivering from that weird contorted position. And that to me is the hard part. So yes, absolutely. We've got to wake up every morning and, and despite the challenges that we find ourselves faced with, m some systemic ones for some people more than others, we have to get ourselves to work or even better in this environment, virtually present ourselves but I still fear that, that the challenge isn't really about the individual then. Yeah. It's about why the individual has to armor themselves. A bit of accommodation is normal, right? And this is the weird part in talking about the, the language of accommodation. A bit of personal accommodation is normal. Having to bring yourself to work in a way that it's, it's, it's your most easily accessible to your colleagues. What's weird to me is that when accommodation is required, when accessibility is required, by for the individual by the organization it's less fulsomely given so it just feels to me like the the bargain the partnership is not equal why is that john why is it i, I mean I, I don't the problem is so i my team has this thing well i have this thing and so now my team has this thing well i say we should never ask questions that we know the answer to because oftentimes when we do that what we're actually doing is and i know we're not doing it here because we know the answer but Workplaces do this. So why is that happening? Why are none of our senior people uh, women? Why, why, why do we have so few people with disabilities working in our organization? Don't ask that. You know why. Yeah. Because when it comes to interview, you look at that person and you say, oh, boy. It's going to be difficult. Are we going to have to make this reasonable come? Oh, you know. The, people just want what's more comfortable to them personally. People are constantly sacrificing organizational performance on the altar of personal comfort and I think that's part of the challenge people have this image in their head of what a good employee looks like a good employee. Includes, yeah yeah, yeah. They, they absolutely do they know what looks right and what looks not right and sometimes what looks not right it is obvious like it's a white person it's a man it's a person who's is able-bodied there you go but sometimes it's more subtle than that. And it's just even the way someone's brain works, where they process information. And I don't mean like neurodiverse. I mean, simply the way their brain grabs hold of information and processes it is not the way that they prefer. So we end up with these homogenous organizations. Do you know, you're one of the lives best in terms of calling this stuff out, John. Can I play with this a little bit more? Please. I want to play with this. So, you know, as you know, our, our community are these amazing change agents who are working within workplace networks and supporting the process of change. We, we often talk about the sweet spot, John, because on the one hand, they're calling out uh, best practice, but they're also calling out less best practice and supporting their business to do differently and better at the top of the shop. Mm -hmm. yeah, the policies, the practices, the procedures. But they're also in that sweet spot of noticing particularly those maybe who are newly diagnosed with a disability or a health condition. And, and as we know, you know, um, 
you know, one of the, I'm, I'm not a fan of special pleading when it comes to uh, the, uh, the sector, the, uh, you know, human characteristics of difference. And yet what we do, you know, within Purple Space is notice some truths that come out of the disabled person's community, uh, irrespective of type of impairment, irrespective of severity, irrespective of, um, you know, levels of confidence and resilience and life experience, etc. And not everyone is out and loud and proud and, and, and because a lot of people will have hidden impairments, they have a choice as to whether they, they surface that, whether they talk about that. Um, and of course, many will have their own workarounds. They don't even need to ask for a workplace adjustment because they don't need to, it's not visible. And therefore they will choose deliberately to find their own workaround. So that's the kind of context there. Um, so notwithstanding, you're absolutely right to call out, I suppose, the work practices, the things that we know already that need to be done, the reasons why there may be systemic challenge. What, nonetheless, what advice, what thoughts do you have about helping people to ask for the workplace adjustments that they might need? I think particularly in these times when so many employers are challenged, because of the pandemic, there have been so much more to do, reorganizing themselves, reorganizing their people. And, you know, a lot of disabled people have been held back in the queue because they have felt unable. But what thoughts do you have with that, John? How would you encourage your fellow man or woman, non-binary person to, to ask for what they need? So I've been asked this question a lot in the context of black colleagues who underreport their yeah. blackness. And we know, we know that it's essential for high quality data in order for organizations to move and change. That's, that's what we need. The problem I have is that I don't like to make other people take risks when I don't have any consequences for what they do. Yeah. So in the organizations, even in the best of them, are we sure that the manager who makes the decision, who's usually not the CEO or whoever else is represented when talking about disability and usually has a great handle on it and speaks well, do we know that that particular manager will take no difference in behavior, will not decide who he brings into the huddle to have that important conversation, who he decides to take on, an, uh, on a pitch, who he decides to have contribute the, their ideas, do we know that there'll be no consequence? Because if we don't, then who am I to tell that person, you must, you should disclose, you must disclose. I think part of the challenge, what we have to do is, is look at disclosure a little differently. And I'm a psychologist, so of course I look at it in an odd way. But to me, disclosure, people misunderstand it. People misunderstand what disclosure is all about. People think disclosure is you learning something about another person. So when I tell you something, um, coming out is the most obvious way, but it's also when coming out about disability or impairment, it's also about lots of different areas. Gender identity, they think it's me if I say, by the way, I'm a gay person, what you think is that you're learning something about me, but you're not. You're actually learning something profound about you you're learning that my identity is really important to me and that I have looked at you and found you worthy to carry it. Disclosure is always about the other person, always. When somebody tells you something important, a piece of their history that they haven't shared, something about a relationship that didn't go well, something about their most favorite holiday place, what they're telling you is that, that, that at the very least, you're not going to yuck their yum, right? I tell you, this is my favorite thing. And you're not going to say, well, I don't care about that. That's terrible. But when it comes to something like that can actually have an impact on your career, and you, you'll know with the research that your, that your team has done, that people are profoundly stupid about this sometimes, especially when it comes to disability. And it can have a real impact on super smart people not getting the opportunity to deliver that they should. So maybe that's where we got to focus. Maybe disclosure is something that organizations need to earn. Maybe when they look and they see the number of times that you know, you've got 20% people who prefer not to say if they've got disability, maybe that right there makes it a strategic point of your agenda for the next three years. Because you know that you don't want to be the kind of organization that people don't trust with their information. I think that's where we go with it.
And then at that point, then we can say to people, hey, your organization has proven that they will take your information and use it to make your organization more optimal for everybody. They deserve your information. Beautiful, beautiful, John. Reflecting, silenced, jotting notes down. I love it. I can see the next book coming on. I love it, John. Look, playing with this and looking at time, you know, we could go on to midnight, but I think people have got jobs to do. So we're going to have this, we said we'd have this 20 minute conversation. We've got to have another few minutes. Um, let me follow my nose here, John. So we've, we've seen through COVID some fantastic responses from employers. I mean, really first class. Mm -hmm. They've ripped up the rule book when it comes to the procurement policy. They've not been able to get existing kit and gizmos to their people. So they said, go buy them on Amazon. Just go buy. Yep, don't worry about our procurement policy. Just go buy. Uh, and then we'll catch up with you and make sure we do the health and safety check, et cetera. But some great things, but also some pockets of less than good practice, of course. Um, and what is true, I suppose, one of the, the common themes for those employers who have responded exceptionally well are those where we see an active, vibrant network of employees, of allies, of champions. That's where they've done particularly well. But, you know, we, you and I have spoken about this. We've, we've, we've spoken in real time. We've spoken on tweets. Um, and I, you know, listened to you over the last few months as you play with these concepts. But if you were to predict or to scenario scan and start to think about how employers are going to respond going forward, um, and neither of us are fans of describing things as the new normal, you know, things are far too flow, fluid. And I was reading the other day about the bubonic plague and I have frightened myself um, in terms of these waves. But yeah, so your thoughts about some of the things that employers might do, might not do in responding to the pandemic? So... <sighs> I, I, I can probably best talk about what I hope yeah, employees yeah. will do. Um, I hope they will look at this as an opportunity. I hope they will suddenly realize that this is, this is an inclusion opportunity right here. I know for many of us, this is exhausting, what, what's been going on for, but I, for the last three or four months. But I need to stress to people, you have not been working from home. You have been, uh, for many of the people, on, especially on this call, you have been under extreme fear and anxiety, worry about your susceptibility to a string of protein that wants to kick our collective asses. And, and we have been under penalty of law, confined to our homes, trying to take care of ourselves, trying to make sure that we don't spread a virus to people we care about, and even more nobly to people we do not know. And in that midst, we've been trying to work. But remote working can be very different from this. When we, when we really start to bookend it, when people realize it doesn't have to spill into five o'clock in the morning till, till nine at night, it doesn't have to spill into your weekends. You can actually have this, the same disciplined kind of day or even better for many of us, we can decide we want to work from four in, in the morning until, until whatever in the afternoon and then have the rest of the day to do other stuff. We can do that with some flexibility around client meetings and things like that. I'm hoping that people will realize that I'm hoping that organizations will realize that their office space was never what it was supposed to be. Offices existed primarily because people don't trust their employees. They don't trust them with the information that they have. They don't trust them not to spread that information around and they don't trust that they'll work when they're not being watched. That's what offices are for. And maybe offices can be something different. Maybe for those of us who are working in remote, maybe we don't, maybe what we need is a place to actually meet our colleagues again but not not just this I'm, i mean social in the best kind of way right not just a drink and sitting with it but the idea that we're spending time with each other just talking about ideas that are occurring to us getting to know each other offices as spaces for induction for teaming that kind of thing and in which case we need to rethink them do we need as much space perhaps not but do we need spaces that are better designed so that every single person can contribute because that to me is the thing to think of. How do we make sure every single person can contribute? How do we make sure that they are mixed spaces so that there can be places for people to come actually physically, but also people to contribute virtually and feel as much a part of the conversation? The technology is available for that. It's just yeah. that most offices don't think of that as a work scope. 
Yeah. Just think there's so many ways that we can have practical changes that will mean that, I mean, how many people have been restricted by the, the job that they want by their physical location, their inability to commute, or at least how ridiculously difficult that commute is. Yeah. And that's not just people with disabilities, that there's lots of people have found that caring responsibilities, all kinds of other stuff. And now we can say your brain, Kate, your brain is so good that if I can have you after the drop off in the morning or after you've had some physio or whatever else, and I can have you for three hours then, and I can have you for another three hours later on, I'll take that. If you can, if you can zoom into our meeting with a client, give us your brilliance for, for 45 minutes and then yeah, that's, I'll take that. That's what we need. That's what the future is winning, winning with the best minds. John, as you say, it's an opportunity, isn't it? We want employers to notice that opportunity and you're right. It supports and it, it's, it's a much more delicious, more blended way of living. Oh, that I love. It's a much more delicious way. That's exactly right. It is. And so you many people. swear that does. That's almost, that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I love the expression I heard the other day, the other week. It's not so much that we're all working from home. It's that we're all sleeping at the office. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. exactly. And we've learned how to do that in shifts and with the family and with parents and children and loved ones. But now John, we need we to make just... it less stressful than it is, right? Now we need to make it so that people realize that when we have a meeting like this, yeah. I'm in your house. Yeah. Sometimes for junior people, I'm in your bedroom. So the whole way we manage is going to be better. Sorry, go ahead. I love it. We could be here till midnight. I know. Let's just keep so, talking. You're happy. <laughs> Two quickie questions. I'm going to co-join together. So, so play with me here. So, um, you know, as we as we as we finish today, and as you know, I'm reflecting on this month's theme. You know, which is all about careers. How do you feel ambitious? How do you keep feeling ambitious? If, of course, ambition is part of your part of your uh, nature. Um, but, you know, what? what thoughts would you have about how i suppose disabled people can learn from other movements you know you know we've got people dialing in not just in the uk from around the world so of course all legislations are ever so slightly different but to use uk as an example in the mid 90s of course we secured the disability discrimination act of course we now have the equality act but that was 20 years after the race relations act the sex discrimination act and we know all legislations are nothing but a compromise but so my thoughts would be, you know, what, what can disabled people learn from other movements? And then the second part of that question, you know, you, you know, we lead the purple light up on the 3rd of December, which is our mark of respect to the United Nations International Day of Persons with Disability. Your thoughts about why that has taken off. It's not all glam and glitz and purple light bulbs. That's not the point. It's about action. It's about celebration. It's about disabled people, allies and champions coming together and choosing to be noticed, to yes. celebrate economic contribution in the tax coffers across the world. So thoughts, what can we learn from other movements? What do we need to take forward as we take forward the purple light up? What we can learn is that um, equality is conflict. It's not always a fight, but it's always conflict there is no movement I can think of that's made any measure of progress without appearing at some points antisocial. Now, how the antisocial nature manifests, it changes. I don't think particularly that dumping statues into the, into, uh, into the sea is, I like it symbolically, don't get me wrong. I think slavers being dumped into the sea is most appropriate. But I'd rather do something more useful uh, and more democratic have these things in museums and so but antisocial is part of it one of the things i think that 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 pe persons with disabilities do not recognize they do not often well they don't often enough recognize how brilliant they are i, I have a friend and, and she does not as much as she would claim otherwise she doesn't know how good she is doesn't know and will never say it and needs to because then you suddenly realize who's the bloody asset you are and you should you should regard yourself and treat your organization like like people who think and know that they're an asset do and that means you need to start walking getting out there vote with your vote with your feet get out there it's time it, it's time to 
to stop staying with organizations that don't see your potential. If they can't see the brilliance in your mind, they don't deserve you. And I know that it may seem like there's not organizations out there, but frankly, change sector, change whatever you need to, but find someone who sees you for you. Because when people start seeing that attrition of talent, there are things that I've been made aware of by people in my life that I just, I just would not have the stuff that I have if I didn't have their insights. And so when I see people now, it, it, there's this different approach because there's I'm honing in on what's in their mind. And if people are distracted by whether you're a wheelchair user, whether you're partially sighted or something else, this is to be punished. You can smile while you're doing it, but wonder to somebody who gives a damn about you. Oh, John, I love it. I love it. I miss you. I miss <laughs> you. Look, whenever I get back to London, if I ever get back to London, we'll have we'll a get back to London and we, we shall have beverages. Yes, indeed. John, this is such good fun with you. Thank you so much. We've been live chatting. We've had lots of people in the chat room saying, is this going to be recorded? And the answer is absolutely yes. We've recorded this so you can watch it again. So let me close by first saying, John, real high five. It's so lovely to, to be with you and in your company. And so many of us are enjoying what you're doing, calling out real challenge. So keep doing what you do so splendidly well. Um, and thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you all for listening. We've had nearly 200. So absolutely amazing that you freed up time to join us. So we hope you've enjoyed a little of that. John and I could go on for midnight. And if there was a glass of wine, the conversation would get even more interesting. Yes, <laughs> so <it> next <laughs> um, For those of you who want to see this again or to circulate this, then it'll be on the website or you can email us if you want more information about Purple Space. Hello at purplespace.org. And of course, it will be on YouTube on our website and the wonderful John and his team will also circulate it. So thank you for joining. John, have a splendid day and we will thank see you, you very, very soon. It's a wonderful way to start my week. Thanks, Kate. Pleasure. 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 I want to reach out. Take care. Soon.